Hello everybody, thank you for the questions. There's quite a lot to go through here, so I'm just going to get started. Uh, okay, Aaron Gabriel asks, what is it you like about Against Method? Um, well, it has a lot of clever, challenging arguments. Uh, it defends some fairly radical ideas. It's really well written. I mean, Far Farabend was an enormously entertaining writer. There's a lot of just funny, amusing stuff in there. Um, and I mean, it, you know, it, can, it contains a conception of rationality that at heart I agree with. Um, there are no universal rules or algorithms for the construction of knowledge. Um, and I, you know, it, was, it was an important book in my own philosophical development because it was the first book that got me really thinking critically about philosophy of science. I mean, I'd engaged with philosophy of science before I read it, uh, but it, it was just a book that made me realise that a lot of my naive ideas were open to serious challenge. Uh, you know, Kant once said that Hume woke him from his dogmatic slumbers. Firebend did that for me. Um, so it's, it's just a great book in itself, and it's a particularly important book in my philosophical development. So that's why I, I like Against Method. Um, okay, Abby Thwaite says, are you a one-boxer or a two-boxer? I assume this is in reference to Newcomb's problem. If it's some sort of euphemism, then I'm definitely a two-boxer. But if we're talking about Newcomb's problem, I'm firmly on the one-boxing side. Um, Rindicka asks also if I'm a uh, one-boxer in Newcomb's problem. So this is also a response to Rindicka. Uh, I did a video about Newcomb's problem a little while ago. Um, which is in the lecture style, but it's definitely one of my most opinionated lectures. I do not hide the fact that I think that two boxing is silly. Uh, I mean, I think it's a good lecture. It's, it's very fair. I think I present the arguments fairly, but I'm very open about the fact that I'm a one boxer. Um, why am I a one boxer? Well, because I want the million pounds. One boxing will get me the million pounds, and absolutely none of the arguments that have been made by two boxers are have provided any remotely convincing reasons uh, for me to think that there's anything irrational about one boxing. Um, you know, maybe I'll put it like this, right? If you adopt a theory of rationality which entails that one boxing is irrational then I think you're working with a conception of rationality that nobody should care about. Uh, that, that, yeah, we, we, it, it, it's wrong, right? You, you're working with the wrong conception of rationality. Changing my mind about this, I think, would, would require some pretty massive changes in my world view. Um, so yeah, I mean, I haven't really changed my mind since I made that lecture. One thing I do wish that I talked about more in that video is the nature of causality. Um, so, yeah, because one of the standard arguments that two boxers will make is that one boxing somehow implicitly depends on assuming that there can be retro causality. Um, this is what a lot of two boxers say, is that, that one boxing uh, Im implicitly assumes that you can causally affect the predictor. So by choosing one box, I cause the predictor to put the million in the box. Um, and now I think that one boxers have a bunch of perfectly reasonable responses to this, but actually, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not really a realist about causality. I'm attracted to a more pragmatic account of causal language. Uh, it's very, very useful to talk in causal terms. It's very useful to construct models that attribute causality. But if we lived in a world where we frequently encountered Newcomb type problems, um, it would be, I suspect, much more natural to attribute retro causality, and then maybe wouldn't it wouldn't seem like there's anything weird with retro causality. We would conceive of ourselves as manipulating things in the past. So, um, if I did that lecture again, I'd want to talk more about causality, and I'd want to challenge the idea that there's necessarily anything wrong with thinking of retro causality in that in that case. Um, Hugh Price and somebody else, I can't remember the other person's name, have a wonderful article called Clickbait for Causalists, which talks about causality in Newcomb problem situations um, in, in a lot more sophistication than I just have done there. Uh, 
So I'm just going to say you should check out that article. I think it's available for free online. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a one boxer. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> abs abs soup in here abs yeah abs abs soup in here or something along those lines asks why does anything exist at all uh i don't know and that's pretty much all i can say about that i do think that it's a perfectly sensible question um you know some people think otherwise uh some people will try to say there's something illegitimate about asking that question um because when we give an explanation, we explain one thing in terms of something else. If you're asking why does anything exist at all, it looks like you're asking for an explanation, right? An explanation of why stuff exists, of why anything exists. Um, now, if, if I ask why does X exist, uh, usually what I'm requesting is I'm requesting you to cite something that brought about X. So I'm requesting that you cite some something y that brought about the x um, but obviously anything we cite to explain why there is something why there is anything at all will itself be something hence it will be part of what we want to explain um, the way i see it though i you know it's it's a request for an explanation i i don't think it's necessarily a request for a causal explanation um, if you were to ask what caused anything to exist like you know what what caused things to exist that that would be silly um, but you know it might it might not be causal right you can explain existence uh, by appealing to necessity for example um, so if you think of modal claims in terms of possible worlds nothingness might be logically impossible uh, on the possible worlds account to say that something is possible is to say that there is a possible world at which that thing obtains. So it's possible that pigs can fly because there is a possible world at which pigs are flying around. Um, but there can be no world at which there is just nothing because you know a world has to be something. A world, even if it's an empty world, even if it's like an empty space time, um, then that's still something. Uh, so if if you look at it from that point of view, well, there's an explanation for why why there isn't nothing, let's say. Um, I don't endorse that explanation, but that's just a, a, an example of how you can answer that question without uh, illegitimately appealing to causes. Um, so, uh, so yeah, but my, my own position is I, I just, I don't know. I don't know why uh, anything at all exists um, and I don't see any prospect of, of getting a conclusive answer to that question. Though I, w I would say that my reaction to it has always been it's not surprising to me that things exist. Um, I also don't see why something shouldn't have just popped into existence. Just, you know, that it just it just sort of happened. It just came into existence and, and that's that. Um, that seems perfectly acceptable to me. Uh, okay. Um, Oh, uh, also asks, how dare you shave the neck beard? Good enough for the lions, but not good enough for you. Well, I was single for a long time. Um, I was dating totally unsuccessfully. Uh, and, you know, there comes a point where sacrifices have to be made. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll probably grow it back one day. One day I'll, I'll, I'll get it back. But for now, you know what? I, I, I shaved it off because um, there's not anything obviously defective about me right uh i mean there are yeah i mean maybe there are aspects of my personality that some people won't like sure you can't appeal to everybody but there's nothing obviously wrong with me okay i i may not look like brad pitt but i'm not terrible looking um i i'm reasonably thoughtful about people you know i i will consider other people's interests at least if they're people i care about um I'm fairly smart, uh, you know, th th I have lots of good qualities, right? Uh, but I just was, you know, the dating was going terribly, nobody was interested. And I just thought, well, there is one thing about me that immediately kind of <laughs> puts people off, at least in terms of attractiveness, you know, in terms of physical attractiveness, and that's the neckbeard. Maybe getting rid of the neckbeard would help. Um, so I, I got rid of it for that reason. And 
I will probably get it back again one day, but not not right now. It's gone now, and you know, uh, I don't know. I'm 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 just living without it for a while. Okay, Adam Kennedy asks, "Are you a vegan slash vegetarian? If not, my question is." What is true of non-human animals, which, if true of humans, would make it morally acceptable, in your view, to kill humans for the purpose of consumption? So, what's the difference, I think, is what you're asking there. What, why is it okay to kill animals but not humans, I think is, that's it, right? Um, well, first of all, it is okay to kill some humans um, under various circumstances. Um, but the main difference between humans and animals is our greater cognitive sophistication. Uh, and in particular, animals have no conception of death. I don't think you're really even... I, I don't know. To me, killing an animal isn't really even doing anything bad to the animal. Um, like, if you torture an animal, I can see why you would say, well, you're, you're harming it, you're doing something bad to it, because it will want the torture to stop, right? It will, you know, animals experience pain, they try to get away from pain. Um, but it doesn't even matter to the animal whether it lives or dies. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I, animals don't even have a conception of themselves, or they don't have, like, you know, long-term projects that they're engaging in or anything like that um, that seems to me to be a very significant difference between humans and animals um, of course it also follows from this that it's acceptable to kill some humans um, but you know killing is uh, since killing is a fairly serious uh, m moral wrong um, at least if you're killing human, if you're killing, you know, a cognitively sophisticated human who wants to continue living, uh, in that case, killing them is, is seriously bad. And since development occurs gradually and there's gradations of cognitive sophistication, I think it makes sense to just draw a legal line and say, no killing of any humans. Um, but, I mean, honestly, uh, I, I don't think killing humans is morally problematic in all circumstances. So, you know, um, yeah, I mean, but look, I, I don't have a sophisticated moral system or anything like that. I'm very firmly uh, on the anti-realist side, and you can totally construct moral systems if that's what you want to do, but I just increasingly feel like I, I don't care to do that. Um, as I see it, morality is simply a matter of, on the one hand, our brute emotional reactions, like there's just some things that we just deeply emotionally object to um, and and on the other hand a kind of uh, reciprocal altruistic kind of reasoning um, so you know uh, I won't stab you because I don't want you to stab me and I recognize that you don't want me to stab you and so I can say hey let's come to an agreement here uh, you know now that kind of reasoning that kind of rational reciprocal altruism that's really only applicable to other cognitively sophisticated humans who can engage in that reasoning for you and it's only applicable to cases where you can actually identify so if, if we're talking about killing well we have to be able to say that the person wants to continue living which i don't think we can say for um for non-human animals at least for most of them i i don't think they really have a conception of, of death um uh and as for the brute emotional reactions, well, obviously killing animals can provoke a brute emotional reaction, but there's not much in the way of an argument that you can give there. Like, uh, if you don't experience a negative emotional reaction to killing animals, then that's it. And, and for, yeah, for what it's worth, I don't. I don't really, I don't really care about animals. So, um, yeah, that's maybe not a very sophisticated answer, but, but that's the answer I'm going to give. Uh, Andrew Martinez asks, if you could create a dream department with currently alive philosophers, who would you choose? And this question got a lot of likes, so it's a popular question, and I'm afraid I don't have a very good answer to it. Uh, I don't really pay much attention to departments. Uh, like, it's, it's relevant if you're thinking about, okay, where should I go to do my PhD? Something like that, right? Then you need to consider what philosophy departments are like, but, um... I don't know, man. I, I've never thought about this kind of question. Uh, and I mean, thinking about it, if I take the philosophers that I like and I put them all in the same department, 
Uh, is that going to make them better philosophers? I'm I'm not sure it would. Uh, also, I mean, one of the issues with the dream department is that I, I think what I want is a variety of departments. It's useful to have some departments that are relatively unified, that have a bunch of philosophers all working closely together on, you know, with, with similar assumptions on similar problems, because that permits this great depth of work. Uh, like you can go into a lot of detail on very specific problems, but then it's also going to be useful to have departments that are more diversified, that encourage a very wide variety of different traditions. And I, I, I want lots of different departments doing lots of different things. So I don't, I don't think I really have a dream department. Um, so I'm afraid I, I don't have uh, an answer to that question. Archie Fisher asks, if you could choose, would you rather nuke a city of pea zombies or one populated by conscious people? Um, I don't think that pea zombies are actually conceivable, so um, that's not really a sensible question. But, uh, like, I mean, if, if I pretend that it is a sensible question, then obviously I'd, I'd go for the pea zombies. Um, why would there be a... I'm curious why you would choose the conscious people I mean what I, I guess maybe if if you're like a negative utilitarian or something then then it would make sense to nuke the conscious people maybe uh, because that would prevent suffering in the future or something like that um, uh, Avante Williams asks what is your formal educational background in philosophy what are your occupational goals slash what are you doing for a living? Well, the background is um, did a philosophy degree, philosophy MA, currently doing a philosophy PhD. Uh, my PhD is fully funded, so that's what I'm doing for a living. Um, I'm very lucky. I, I get I literally get paid to just do philosophy. So that's wonderful. As for my goals, well, it would be nice, I suppose, to remain in academia, but I, I don't really know whether that's going to happen. It's very competitive it's it's difficult to get an academic career and coronavirus and brexit i mean all of this is going to throw things up in the air a bit who knows what the job market is going to look like probably not good um so i'm not confident that i'm actually going to make it but i might as well give it a shot right um also here in the uk uh, lecturers like keep going on strike all the fucking time i mean there have been loads of strikes so they don't seem to be too happy with their circumstances right it doesn't they you know it doesn't just as an outsider looking in you wouldn't think this is um a particularly uh good career um in like the philosophy is great that's fun but in terms of the job itself uh, maybe, it, well, there are problems, but, you know, I suppose there are problems in, in all sorts of fields. But still, uh, I'm going to give it a shot. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Barold Anarchy asks, why would anyone read YouTube comments? Well, I do read YouTube comments and I should probably respond more often. Um, like, I don't know, I do try to, to respond, but I, 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 there's always just other things to do. And responding to comments, like, I don't know, it sometimes feels like work. Um, uh, so I'm not always the best at, at keeping up with responding to comments, but I do read them. Um, you know, if somebody is just unclear about something and wants something clarified, then that's fairly easy to respond. I think that I'm always nervous. I don't like getting into arguments online um, mainly because I think what tends to happen is they're explosive right so if you're engaging in an argument with somebody right you'll be arguing about one particular point and then you'll raise say three points in defense of what you say but then they will disagree with all three of the things you've said and they'll then raise you know three points in response to each of those and then you'll disagree with all the things they say it, it so often happens when you have arguments online that they just seem to expand and uh, get kind of out of control and it's not fun doing that so that's i'm not i'm also not sure it's really useful i don't know if you come to uh, an understanding of, e of each other uh, in that kind of context um so that's 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 one reason why I, I tend not to get into any long discussions. Uh, I mean, sometimes sometimes I do, 
Um, but yeah, I don't have a problem with YouTube comments. I think actually YouTube is is fairly good compared to some places online, right? Like maybe this is just the YouTube videos that I watch. I watch a lot of music videos on YouTube, and the comments on those are always pretty nice. Uh, I've I've there have been some online forums that I've been part of where people get really uh, just cliquey and mean, and I haven't seen that much on YouTube. I haven't seen it on my channel. Haven't really seen it on the types of videos that I watch, but that, as I say, could just be the types of videos that I watch. Um, okay, also asks, do you have any thoughts on the P versus NP problem? No, I have, uh, I know nothing about that literature. Uh, I do try to have a reasonably broad understanding of different philosophical fields. Um, but look, I'm not a mathematician. I don't do philosophy of mathematics. So I know some philosophy of mathematics where philosophy of mathematics is relevant to broader philosophical debates. Um, I, I've, I've read a bit about the, the ontology uh, side of, of this, you know, Platonism versus uh, non-Platonistic views, for instance, um, forms of just general forms of justification in mathematics. I can say a bit about that stuff, but when it comes to very specific mathematical problems, that's really outside my field. Um, so I, I can't comment on that. Benjamin Menashe says, what lesser known books slash essays would you recommend not too technical? You know, I, tr I thought about this question. I saw this question come up earlier. I did have a think about it and I, I don't I don't know. I part, part, part of the reason for this is that to give any recommendations, I, I need to know more about what a person is interested in, like what they've already read. Um, also, I'm not really sure what counts as more or less known like what what i mean i know articles that say are taught in philosophy courses but i'm i'm never really sure if if something is is lesser known or i i mean i i, I don't know and also i don't particularly like giving recommendations um i i can tell people how to find literature that might interest them but uh yeah i I don't know. Um, so that's all I have to say about that. Second, do you think that moral foundations theory and other moral psychology findings, Jonathan Haidt's stuff, have any ethical, meta-ethical implications? Well, yeah. Uh, so if you're an anti-realist, for instance, and you want to say that moral thinking is based on emotional dispositions or something along those lines, then the findings from moral psychology will be very useful in terms of filling in that idea, right? Like if, so if, if you want to say that our moral beliefs or moral attitudes, moral judgments are based on emotional dispositions, you're probably going to want to give a, you know, put, put some meat on the bones of that and say exactly what these emotions are and in what context in what context they are activated um, and moral psychology can help you answer that question. Um, also, Haidt has the social intuitionism stuff. Um, again, that seems, it seems like quite easy to accommodate that kind of model on an anti-realist view. So moral reasoning as based on these immediate intuitions, these immediate gut reactions that people then rationalize after the fact. Um, these kind of results can play into things like the evolutionary debunking arguments given in metaethics. So the evolutionary debunkers will say that our moral beliefs are, pro are a product of our evolutionary history. They don't track the truth. Um, I think there's probably a connection between moral psychology and that kind of argument. Uh, so there are relations, but I do think that we can you know, you've got to be careful not to draw too much from this, right? Um, so, for instance, the intuitionist model, right? This idea that moral reasoning works by these immediate gut reactions that are then rationalized after the fact. That's probably true for many empirical beliefs as well, for beliefs about how the world, about what the world is like. Um, with many empirical beliefs, I suspect that people form the belief that they that they like for one reason or another and they they form it on a partially emotional basis and then they look for confirmation of that belief um i think that's how it often not always but often tends to work um 
so yeah i mean and and you're not going to want to like be an anti-realist about whether or not global warming is happening for instance um but still people's beliefs about whether or not global warming is happening probably work similarly in some cases uh you know somebody will just form a belief that they that they like or maybe they that is more um compatible with their political views right like a lot of libertarians it seems to me will reject global warming just because they don't want to have to say that um governments should regulate the economy and uh you know global warming is a pretty powerful reason for state regulation so that's a case of an empirical belief about the world which is accepted for emotional or ideological reasons and then people look for confirmation of it um but again you wouldn't want to be an anti-realist about a claim like whether or not global warming is happening there's a fact of the matter there um more generally i don't conceive of meta-ethical theories as psychological hypotheses um i don't really think of them as, to me anyway a meta-ethical theory isn't any kind of empirical hypothesis um i mean we have to take psychology into account just because we we have to take the facts into account but um it we're not doing psychology um my view is that meta ethics and a lot of philosophy in general is more about what we might call conceptual explication um so it's not purely descriptive what's what we're doing is what we what we're trying to do when we do meta ethics is give a general account of things like moral value moral attitudes moral language um colloquial moral discourse and colloquial moral like everyday moral reasoning is confused and messy and incoherent and part of the project of philosophy is to clean it up and to see if we can get something precise and coherent out of this messy thing um so it's it's a project of of explication of we take our vague and incoherent moral concepts and then produce something precise and coherent uh and so that's not really a, a a psychological hypothesis although we do have to take psychology into account um yeah i think that's an answer to that question uh bistful i think asks what do you do in your spare time my favorite things beyond uh philosophy and other academic stuff um number 1 sex that does not occur with the frequency that would be ideal although the situation has improved substantially quite recently um but that is something i really love doing uh second music uh, i listen to everything from free jazz to 80s pop i i have fairly broad tastes some of my favorite artists frank zappa grateful dead john cage uh Derek Bailey, James Tenney, Sun Ra, uh Steely Dan, Motorhead, Steve Reich, John Hassel, uh Ryo G Aikido, uh yeah, I I listen I lo- I love a lot of music, so I listen to a lot of music. Um television. Um I don't watch a huge amount of television. I'm a big fan of Doctor Who, particularly the classic series. Uh, and and I love it for all of the reasons that many other people might think it's bad you know the wobbly sets the monsters made of bubble wrap the terrible synthesizer music the fact that every alien planet looks like a british quarry uh all of all of these reasons are things that give it its charm um and I I I do watch uh modern doctor who as well uh I love the capaldi era I think that that was that was that was just as good as the classic series that had absolutely wonderful characters dazzlingly imaginative stories um the recent stuff with jody whitaker totally sucks uh although that's not her fault i'm not against i i actually was very much uh in favor of of a female doctor i've always wanted to see what a woman would do with the role even before uh modern doctor who even started so like when i was a kid uh only the classic series existed back then and and even back then i i thought it was a shame that 
there had never been a female doctor. But so when, you know, Doctor Who was rebooted, I was like, great, I, uh, you know, now, now it's, now that might happen. And it did happen. Um, but the, the writing absolutely sucks. So uh, that's been a massive disappointment. And I think that Jodie Whittaker herself has been kind of miscast. Like I want a woman doctor, but I don't want her. She sucks. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, I should probably move on because I'm just talking about Doctor Who. But look, you wanted to know what I do in my spare time. Big fan of Doctor Who. Um, other things I do, I have a microscope. So I sometimes look at stuff through the microscope. I like to create digital art. Uh, in, in general, I love art, you know, so that's something else I do. Uh, but I think that's, yeah, that's that's most of my spare time there. Bilbo Swaggins says, um, do you prefer Schopenhauer's philosophical pessimism or Nietzsche's Dionysian pessimism and affirmation of life. Well, it'd have to be Schopenhauer, only in virtue of the fact that I don't know Nietzsche well enough to have an opinion on this. Um, and with Schopenhauer, I don't know him particularly well either. What I know about Schopenhauer mainly comes from my friend Cole, because she's uh, she's big on Schopenhauer, knows a lot about him. Um, not that I necessarily agree with Schopenhauer, but I would say I have a fairly pessimistic attitude. Um, Schopenhauer, with, with Schopenhauer, his pessimism is deeper than mine, right? Schopenhauer, uh, and I'm probably going to butcher this, but he, he, his view is this, is that there's this life that consists of this kind of pendulum that swings from um, dissatisfaction to boredom, or, or rather from unfulfilled desire to boredom. And both of those are sort of states of dissatisfaction. They're both unpleasant states. Um, so, you know, you're usually in a state of of striving, right, of having a desire that is unfulfilled, right, but then once you get what you want, you just get bored, um, uh, and uh, so on, on this kind of view, it's it's not even possible, like the structure of psychology, and, and maybe even just, the, I don't know if he, he might make a claim even broader than that, actually, but certainly the structure of psychology is such that a good life is just unavailable to us. Um, I think that it would be possible to have a good life uh, if you were to get into, you know, Nozick's experience machine or something like that. Um, I mean, nobody has ever had a life like that, so who knows? Uh, but I think, I think, yeah, if 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 I lived in Nozick's experience machine, I think I'd basically be happy. My pessimism then is more contingent, right? For, so for Schopenhauer, I think the the dissatisfaction is just necessarily built into human psychology any kind of psychology whereas my own inclination is to say well we could have good lives it's just that the world doesn't cooperate with us um and um i mean look this is this is all bullshit though because i'm just talking about myself here uh, obviously if somebody says to me that that they love their life and they're really happy and uh, they're satisfied frequently then what like okay i mean i've got nothing to say to that um so you know but i myself uh, when I reflect on life, I think it, it is basically bad. I think it's just negative. And it's a bit odd because I'm not depressed at all. Uh, in fact, I'm a fairly, I, I have a fairly sunny disposition, I would say. Um, but, but no, if I, w when I engage in, a, in an intellectual reflection on it, um, I do think life is bad and I, I don't think there's really any way to escape that. Um, you know, Mill and many others like him draw draw a distinction between higher and lower pleasures, and they think that well, you can you can achieve a good life or at least a better life by uh, pursuing the higher pleasures. I actually don't think it makes any difference, right? I think that the the so-called higher pleasures have exactly the same problems. So philosophy is one of the higher pleasures, but philosophy is when you do philosophy, it's mostly just frustration. Um, I mean, it's not fun, right? At least, I don't, I don't think it's fun. Like writing a philosophy essay or doing one of these videos for YouTube, when I, when I write the videos, that's just hard. It's, it's not satisfying. I do it because I, I aim for this satisfaction in the future, but then when I've actually finished the video, like that's what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming for a state where I have created something, right? That's what I want to do. My my desire is directed towards creating this product. Um, 
And so I endure this frustration because I have this drive to create this thing. But then when I've created that thing, I don't actually get any satisfaction from that. I mean, well, maybe like once I've finished a, a video for YouTube, um, there's a minute of, of pleasure, uh, like, hey, I've done it. And then I upload it and I feel good about that. And then it's just gone almost immediately. And then I'm on to the next thing. And then I'm in a state of frustration and I'm doing hard work that I don't really need to do, but I just feel like I have to because I have to create this thing. And that's just the way that life in general is. Um, <laughs> so, so life is basically bad. And uh, yeah, I, but I don't know. That's maybe not what Schopenhauer said. So I don't really know Schopenhauer. I haven't I've read like a couple of pages of Schopenhauer. Everything I know about Schopenhauer comes from Cole. But she's told me that my perspective is similar to Schopenhauer's. <clears throat> Borders. What are your thoughts on later Wittgenstein? Oh, that's my thought on later Wittgenstein. Look, man, I don't have all woman. I don't know what you are, man or woman. Um, I don't have anything interesting to say about Wittgenstein, and I'm not going to enjoy talking about him. So can I just skip this one? I like can can I can I I don't think there's going to be anything enlightening coming from me when it comes to Wittgenstein and I don't like Wittgenstein. So I'm just going to move on. Sorry. Uh do you agree with Ladyman that scientifically informed metaphysics is largely worthless? Well, I think that metaphysics in general is largely worthless. So in that sense, yeah, I, I, share many, I share many of his criticisms of traditional analytic metaphysics, although not all. Um, so, well, for one thing, Ladyman goes all in on this kind of physics worship, which I find a little bit embarrassing. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, so, so for Ladyman, metaphysics is bad, partly because it contradicts the sciences. Um, in particular, physics, right? And that's that's what makes it really bad. Uh, I don't care about that. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a problem. I don't think it's necessarily a problem for philosophical theses to contradict the sciences. Um, in any case, I also think that if we're presenting that as a criticism of metaphysics, the conclusion is just too sweeping. I think science is irrelevant to many metaphysical debates. If you take debates about material composition, for instance, uh, meteorological nihilism, that kind of stuff. It's irrelevant to that, what the fundamental constituents of reality are like. Um, so, like, all you need to get those debates going is the fact that objects can be broken down into parts. And that's obviously true. I can take a stick and I can break it into two sticks. I can see how the stick is composed of these different parts. Um, or I can take a clay statue and then I can crush the clay, right? So that the statue, so the, the shape is gone, like the form, the statue is gone, but the lump of clay remains. Um, all you need to get into a lot of debates about material composition are those everyday facts. Um, uh, those sort of things are what raise questions about the persistence conditions of objects. And those debates may be a load of bullshit, but they're not bullshit in, you know, because physics tells us that there's some weird stuff going on in the quantum realm. Um, like if those debates are bullshit, they're bullshit for some other reason. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't share all of Ladyman's criticism. I do agree with him that the tools that traditional metaphysicians are applying, the appeals to intuition, uh, appeals to common sense, um, evaluating metaphysical explanations, by uh, criteria like simplicity, um, by those you know, non-empirical criteria, those are not effective ways of learning about the way the world is. Uh, so yeah, I, I object to traditional metaphysics, but I don't think you can really improve the situation by making metaphysics scientific. Um, I mean that that like the idea that you can you can get a worthwhile metaphysics out of scientific metaphysics seems to me to rest on two assumptions. So one is just scientific realism. Um, 
it requires you to assume that our theories and models reasonably accurately describe the way the world is. And if you reject that, as I do, then like, you know, you're not going to learn anything about the way the world is by doing metaphysical theorizing with these models. Um, but the second thing is, even if you accept scientific realism, you'd have to assume that that philosophers can legitimately like extend science, that we can learn more facts about the world from theorizing, from engaging in metaphysical theorizing with these scientific models than from what the scientific activity itself provides. And that's something I'm skeptical about as well. So um, yeah, I, I, I agree with the criticisms of traditional metaphysics but not all of them. And I think that scientific metaphysics doesn't actually help, um, or at least it's, it's I don't know, uh, it, it might be better, but um, it's, it's still hopeless. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the philosophy of changing one's mind? I don't know what that's in reference to. I've never uh, done any philosophy of changing one's mind. Um, so, no. Bobster, 708. Which philosophers do you find the most entertaining? Well, interesting question, because entertaining doesn't necessarily mean favourite, right? Although, as it happens, I think the philosophers I find most entertaining are indeed my favourite philosophers. Paul Firebend, Ian Hacking, uh, Robert Nozick. Um, like, I'm just listing favourites here, uh, but they're also the ones that I find the most entertaining. Um, what does it make, you know, what, what does it take to be an entertaining philosopher? You've got to defend some radical ideas, you've got to be a little bit crazy, uh, you've got to write very clearly, you've got to have a sense of humour, you've got to construct good arguments, um, and those are basically the criteria for my favourite philosophers. Uh, maybe an odd choice actually for entertainment, here's, here's one that might be an odd choice, is David Lewis. Uh, David Lewis is a fairly easy read for me, um, which is odd because I mean he's a yeah you know, he's he's a traditional philosopher but something like on the plurality of worlds I find it really entertaining I love that book so much I mean I think it's a load of bollocks but uh, it's great fun to read and I mean it's it's pure like analytic philosophy it's fairly dry actually but I I do find that entertaining um, John Searle is also fairly easy. An easy read, but he's, I don't know, he's, he's, well, he's opinionated. His views are quite traditionalist, though. So, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, so those, those are some philosophers who I, I guess are entertaining. Brian, uh, that's Brian with a W, uh, asks, is a hamburger a sandwich, and what are the philosophical impacts of this distinction? Um, I think that what you tried to do there was ask a joke question but you failed um so uh first of all is a hamburger a sandwich well well yes per the definition of sandwich um i i mean okay like how, how what, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for sandwichhood i mean I, I don't know exactly but i would say like you've got two pieces of bread you put some food in between the pieces of bread so it's it's some vegetables or meat or whatever in between two pieces of bread and I think also a sandwich has to be something you can hold in your hand right like it's something you can pick up and eat with your hand um, like so as long as you've got the pieces of bread the food in the bread eat to eat with the hand that's a sandwich um, also just like I mean I think like a, a burger a hamburger is just uncontroversially considered a sandwich right like uh, in fact let me look this up so I'm just looking up hamburger here. Aha, hamburger, um, and this is from Wikipedia. A hamburger is a sandwich consisting of one or more patties of ground meat, etc. But it's very clearly a sandwich. There's no question that a hamburger is a sandwich. More interestingly, what are the philosophical impacts of this distinction? Well, here's the, the interesting thing. A hamburger seems not to be so sandwich-like, right? Um, and so perhaps this supports, I mean, this might be a good example, at least, of uh, a kind of prototype theory of concepts. Um, traditionally, philosophers have thought of concepts as consisting of, like, necessary and sufficient conditions. So a concept is just a definition, right? Like, it's um, you know, what you might look up in, in the dictionary. Um, and we can 
apply this tool of conceptual analysis um, to I mean, we take an interesting case like the concept knowledge. We can say, well, knowledge is justified true belief. You know, the necessary and sufficient condition for knowledge is justified true belief. Um, what examples like the hamburger maybe suggest is that concepts work instead by you have a, a, a kind of exemplar right, of, of the thing, right, say of a sandwich. An exemplar sandwich would be uh, like literally the kind of sandwich that you you know buy in a shop it's like you know the triangle shape with the with the just pieces of bread and you know some i don't know chicken and salad or, or whatever right um, butter on it okay so if you think of sandwich you have an exemplar and then you judge other things that you encounter in terms of similarity with this exemplar so you have exemplars judged by similarity uh, so there aren't necessary and sufficient conditions for the application of the concept instead the concept consists of this of, of, of an exemplar case and you then judge other things by how similar they are to it um, and so that, that that does challenge the use of conceptual analysis in philosophy because it suggests that you know the search for necessary and sufficient conditions for the application of a concept is just misguided. Like there are just going to be some cases that are, uh, you know, vague cases. Um, uh, a hamburger probably is a sandwich, but it's it's less obviously a sandwich. And if you had a particularly big hamburger that you couldn't pick up with your hands, I mean, maybe that's a sandwich, um, but it's just imprecise and, and there's no fact of the matter. And maybe it's also like that, with concepts such as knowledge and justice and uh, you know these other philosophically loaded terms that we apply the tools of conceptual analysis to. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think a hamburger is a sandwich. I, I think there might be some interesting philosophical impl implications of this point. Um, so your attempt to ask a joke question failed. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Chitaranjan Koiram, um, apologies, I, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, asks, what are your views about non-causal explanations in science? I'm a bit confused about, about this. Are you asking, do I think that there are non-causal explanations? Um, I mean, it's, it, I don't know, it's a, it's a very broad question, that. So I'm, I'm a pluralist about explanation. I think many things can count as explanations. Explanations don't have to cite causes. It seems to me there are some fairly straightforward examples of non-causal explanations. Um, uh, explanations are just answers to why questions, and I don't think you necessarily have to cite a cause to give an answer to that. Um, I, I, you know, I was when I first like encountered um, the let, let's say like the strong causal account, the idea that all explanations are causal explanations. Um, I remember being a bit confused. I was, it was like, well, what's, so what's the point of this? I mean, I get, so I, I can understand the, the arguments, right? There are, there are cases of apparently non-causal explanations, um, and then defenders of a causal account will come along and say, actually, no, these are causal explanations because of X, Y, Z, or no, these don't count as explanations because of such and such. Um, and I was confused about what the payoff of that was supposed to be. Like, you know, why, why did this matter? Um, so it matters that some explanations are causal explanations. Um, because I think that, that that might be important in terms of defending physicalism or scientific realism or whatever. We might need science to give us causal explanations um, in order to make the inference to the best explanation that justifies belief in unobservable entities um, you know I mean like like so well hacking's entity realism for instance arguably rests on on there being causal explanations of some sort arguably not but um, you know I, I, like, I could see I can see why this matters right why why we would care whether or not some explanations are causal explanations um, but but why why do we need to sh like, why does it matter if all of them are I mean I, I couldn't see the payoff and my understanding is, is that it seems like there are many philosophers 
who want to hold to what we might what, what I think is called an ontic conception of explanation. So the idea of an ontic conception of explanation is that explanations are objective. They are things in the world. They are things that we discover. Um, explanations aren't like the products of human activities, right? An explanation is a thing in the world that we discover. Um, it's not pragmatic. It's not relevant uh, relative to our interests. Um, and on the causal view, that's what you get because the explanation for some for something right the explanation for x is just the thing in the world that is causally responsible for x um but i i it just seems to me that the that the ontic conception is i it just seems hopeless to me um like if you think of explanation as being something in the world like an explanation is something in the world that we discover then it no longer makes any sense to talk about good or bad explanations. It no longer makes sense to ask what the constraints are on explanation, to ask whether an explanation can be true or false, etc. Um, it just seems really obvious to me that an explanation is a like representational product of human activity. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah. Um, now that I, I know, I can sort of see a bit more about what the motivation is for giving a just like causal account, a strong causal account of treating all explanations as causal. Um, it, it, perhaps even it seems even less plausible. Um, look, in many cases, I, I would say it's possible to reinterpret explanations in causal terms. Uh, so uh, if you take, say, a covering law explanation or a unificationist explanation, uh, like you can totally reinterpret those in causal terms. But I don't think we have to. Um, I don't think that's in any sense something that we're like compelled to do. Uh, there, are, there are different way for any given explanation. I think there are different interpretations you can give of it, and um, you know the causal is just one among many. I'd also point out that many causal models um, do not cite real-worldly causes because our models are full of abstractions and idealizations. Um, an explanation generally proceeds by constructing a model of some target and then showing how that target fits into some broader theory. Uh, like the model fits the target into the theory. And you often have to idealize the target in order to do that, um, depending on the theory you're dealing with. Um, like th th there are many different ways in which you will idealize the target depending on the theory you're dealing with. But you might. Uh, treat the phenomenon as if it were an ideal gas. So, you know, you treat the star as if it were composed of an ideal gas. This may be a causal model, uh, but the causal relations that it that it uh, contains won't correspond to things going on in the world. Um, now, of course, that's totally compatible with discovering real causes. Like, we can apply false models to discover truths, um, but Again, I don't think we're compelled to interpret the situation in that way. Uh, so, so even when you're dealing with explanations that involve causal models, um, I don't know if that's necessarily going to be a causal explanation. Well, it will be a causal explanation, but uh, it won't cite real-worldly causes. Um, so, what what point am I making here? I'm not. I'm not really sure. But like I said, I I don't. What did you ask? What are your views on non-causal explanations in science? I think there are non-causal explanations, and yeah, I don't know. That probably wasn't a very good answer, but that is the answer you're going to get because I'm not going back and re-recording this. So I'm just going to move on. Um, culture vulture. Do you consider yourself a constructivist in any sense? Is knowledge primarily something that we find, receive, or construct? Well, yeah, I'm definitely a constructivist in some sense. Uh, actually, most people are constructivists in some sense, right? Because we unquestionably construct some things. Uh, there's no doubt that a, something like a constructivist account of money has to be the right account. Um, that's clearly something that we've constructed. Um, but OK, uh, I, I'm, I'm being maybe pedantic here. Uh, am I a constructivist in some sense that would be like philosophically controversial? Well, well, yeah, uh, no doubt. Um, so 
scientific activity is constructive in various significant ways. Um, we, we build models and theories uh, designed to systematize, predict, control the phenomena. Um, now, the models and theories themselves are constructions. Um, it's, we're not engaging in a process of discovery here. You know, when you postulate, say, charged particles in order to explain the aurora borealis, I don't see that as involving a discovery of how the of what the world is like. I see that as the construction of an instrumental model. Um, what about the phenomena themselves? Well, you don't simply compare a model to the world. Uh, rather, you compare a model to a data model uh, or something like that. The world is cleaned up, uh, idealized, abstracted before you can uh, compare it to some scientific model. Um, yeah, the situation is more like a map and a piece of territory, right? There are many different maps you can draw of a piece of territory, and it's the map that we compare to our scientific models. Um, so there are two fairly controversial cases of construction taking place there, in my view. Um, as for knowledge, well, I accept the justified true belief analysis, but I'd say that both justification and truth are constructed in, in some sense, uh, insofar as we have to, in the case of justification, we have to choose the standards for justification. Um, that's, I don't think there are objective facts about this. I don't think this is something that's you know, given to us by the world. We have to make conscious choices about what count as the appropriate standards for justification. Um, like an, uh, the, the obvious case of this will, will be something like the epistemic goals of believing the truth versus avoiding falsehoods. We want to do both, right? We want to believe the maximum number of truths and we want to believe the minimum number of falsehoods. But those pull us in different directions. Um, and it's up to us how we weigh those two goals against each other. And, and that will lead to different standards of justification. Um, as for truth, uh, again, we have to fix the standards for what counts as, as, as truth in a given context. So uh, when I say that the table is flat, well, um, that's true when I'm talking about this table, this table in front of me, um, in this context, because I can place items on it and they don't fall off, right? That's pretty much what requires that they don't wobble. Uh, so it's flat, it's flat for my purposes. But if I was doing a, an experiment in physics or something where I'd need it to be really precise, then uh, it wouldn't count as flat. Um, so that kind of thing is constructive. These standards don't exist mind independently. Um, so yeah, I'd say there are senses in which I'm a constructivist, which may be philosophically controversial. Uh, you also ask, do you agree that most of the constructivists are implicit linguistic determinists in the sense that most uh, constructivist positions depend on the language as the material to create such a position? Um, so I, I assume that, yeah, so we're talking about like social constructionism in the, in the well, I was going to say social constructionism in the philosophy of science, but um, you don't say anything about science there. Um, so what, what, okay, why would most, most constructivists are implicit linguistic determinists? That's, I get, is that stuff like uh, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis? I mean, I must say, I, I don't know if that's really the motivation for constructivism anymore. Like that seems, if you go back to the 1960s, some of the constructivists back then, some of the more radical constructivists, Set, would have said that like you know language our world is like constructed by a language or something like that but i don't think that's the motivation for modern constructivism um i mean at least n not the forms of constructivism that i'm familiar with so if you look at the sociology of scientific knowledge folks like david bloor um i don't think he's a linguistic determinist uh i i think that the that that kind of constructivism is motivated by a more thoroughgoing naturalism, actually. Um, so the constructivist sociologists, at least sociologists of science, 
are motivated by a desire to explain the development of scientific theories without appealing to any normative claims. Uh, so their idea is that we have to appeal to the same types of causes to explain both true and false theories, both successful and unsuccessful theories. Um, we, ex we appeal to the same types of causes to explain what, whatever type, whatever theory was was uh, was accepted. Um, we want a causal explanation that covers all theories, regardless of how we evaluate them. Like regardless of whether we evaluate them as good or bad. Um, now, traditionally, sociologists gave sociological explanations of specifically false theories. Like the idea is, well, we 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 give a sociological explanation for why people came to accept phrenology or creationism. Um, in those cases, we have to appeal to sociological factors. But if we ask why did people come to accept heliocentrism, well, there's no need to appeal to sociological factors there. That occurred because heliocentrism is true, and uh, or at least it's truer than geocentrism. And the scientists in that case were just responding appropriately to the evidence. Uh, right? They they were. Um, conforming to correct standards of evidence and to correct standards of logical inference and so on. Um, so the sociology and psychology and other fields like that, they explain mistakes, but when we go right, when we get it right, the explanation is we're just conforming to correct standards of evidence and inference. Um, and I, I, I take it that the, construct, the, the more extreme constructivists at least uh, want to reject this and just say, no, we, we have to give a purely causal explanation without appealing to any kind of norm, without evaluating whether or not something is right or wrong, justified or unjustified, rational or irrational, good or bad. We give a causal explanation um, for all, all knowledge, all theories. Um, and so, yeah, that's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thoroughgoing naturalism. I don't think there's any... Well, I don't see linguistic determinism in that kind of approach. Um, but there are many kinds of, of constructivism, obviously. Um, and so, I don't know, maybe you have something different in mind. Actually, you know, I, I just, just another point here is constructivists are often thought of as being like the wishy-washy, anti-scientific. Um, I think they're sometimes associated with like more literary movements. But if you read stuff like Knowledge and Social Imagery by David Bloor. It's strikingly hard-nosed naturalist materialism. Uh, um, so yeah, that's, well, not, not really an answer to your question, but um, it's, it's surprising. Uh, you ask also, how can we distinguish a philosopher from a person who knows history of philosophy a lot? Well, I don't know. I don't really care about drawing disciplinary boundaries. Um, my question is always, look, I don't care whether or not something counts as philosophy. What I ask is always just, is this an interesting question? And is this an interesting answer? It doesn't matter how we classify it. Um, but what I would say about this is historians of philosophy are concerned specifically with outlining ideas held by other people. Uh, philosophers put forward their own ideas. Uh, philosophers seek the truth about metaphysics, e ethics, epistemology and so on. Historians of philosophy seek the truth about what people believed about metaphysics, ethics, epistemology and so on. Um, so yeah, I, I, I mean it seems to me there are yeah fairly straightforward distinctions between philosophers and historians of philosophy. Um, but like I say, I it doesn't really matter, um, in my opinion. I think just more generally, like philosophy is is a useful way of the term philosophy is a useful way of capturing areas of inquiry that are more conceptual, not not amenable to empirical investigation, um, that are like you know concerned with well, how did Wilfred Sellers put it? You know how things in the broadest sense of the term hang together in the broadest sense of the term, um, but like that has vague boundaries right um okay cyber mongoose asks wave function interpretation i assume you're asking 
which wave function interpretation I accept. Well, I don't accept any of them. I think that quantum mechanics provides a useful mathematical tool. I don't think there's any need to take it as corresponding to reality. Um, I don't go in for you know, reifying instrumental models. That's what, you, that's what quantum mechanics provides. It provides a bunch of really useful instrumental models and, and that's it. Um, so I, I don't accept any particular wave function interpretation. And in any case, I, I don't actually know much about uh, philosophy of physics specifically. Um, da Boyle says, are you a centrist? If not, then what are your political views? And Owners82 responds by saying that I am a right libertarian. So that so Owners82 says Kane is a right libertarian. Um, I used to be a right libertarian, but it's been a pretty long time since I've been a, a hardcore right libertarian. Um, I don't think have I I don't think I've ever like explicitly endorsed in an unqualified way right libertarianism on this channel um, because I have for a long time been sympathetic to well like for instance I'm sympathetic to the geo libertarian account of the initial acquisition of resources so what a standard right libertarian will say is how do people come to legitimately acquire resources in the first place? Like, how does the initial acquisition occur? Well, it occurs when you mix your labor with the natural resource. And once you do that, it becomes yours. And yeah, there are questions about what exactly counts as mixing your labor. I mean, you know, is it enough to just put a fence around a piece of land or do you have to do something like farm it or whatever? But like once you've sufficiently mixed your labor with the natural resource, then it's yours. And there aren't really any restrictions for right libertarians on how much you can acquire or what you do with it once you have it. Uh, you have full property rights over it. Uh, the geo-libertarian account, by contrast, will say that land and natural resources are in some sense owned by all, right? Like, nobody created natural resources from scratch, okay? We just found them, they're just there. So when you appropriate a natural resource, you're entitled only to the added value that your labor produces. Um, and then you're gonna have to pay compensation to the community for the value of the natural resource in its unimproved state. Um, and so that's that's not so right wing. Um, now, why should we favor the right libertarian account of initial acquisition over the geo-libertarian account? I can't think of any particular of any good reason, um, at least not from a purely theoretical point of view. I mean, it might be the case just like from a consequentialist point of view, it might be the case that one of these accounts of initial acquisition when put into practice results in better outcomes in some sense, but just kind of abstractly, theoretically thinking of it in terms of like rights and ownership, I can't see why you would favor one over the other. Um, and there are plenty of other problems with right libertarianism. Um, so, and that's, I've, I've held that for a long time. I, I, I'm attracted to, I, I, or at least I was very attracted to right libertarianism. Um, and I used to be, before I started this channel, a pretty hardcore right libertarian, but it's been a long time since I would have just endorsed it, period. Like I would have said, yes, I am a right libertarian. Um, I'm increasingly attracted to, to just anarchism, and I don't know if I accept any particular theory of property rights anymore. Um, like, the, the, the property relations will be different in different communities. I, 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 I well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that my opinions are in a, a process of change, and I haven't quite come to a, a clear uh, position yet. Um, so... I'm certainly not centrist, though. No, I'm. I'm. I am some sort of libertarian, definitely, and I'm fairly extreme about it as well. <clears throat> Dragon Empire asks, "What is the best argument against substance dualism?" Well, I think. Um, I think for me, it would probably be the the point that substance dualism doesn't actually tell us anything about how the mind works. It doesn't offer any kind of solution to the mind-body problem. Um, indeed, it just creates, it creates a whole bunch of new problems of its own, like the interaction problem. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually offer an explanation, right? It's not, even if it were true, it wouldn't be a solution to anything. Um, 
I mean, I don't know. This isn't really an argument against it, is it? Because this doesn't, yeah, this isn't an argument that it's not true. But, but look, it, it, yeah, it, do, it doesn't actually offer an explanation of anything. So suppose that substance dualism were true. Suppose that um, there are mental substances in addition to physical substances. Um, well then, like, there are two questions that you, so the question about the mental substance is going to be, does it have further non-mental properties, right? Like, so this, this mental substance, this, this alternative substance, right? are there non-mental properties out of which the mental properties arise? Um, and if the answer to that is yes, well, now we just have the standard problem of explaining how the mental is constituted out of the non-mental. And we've got the same explanatory gap and the same problems um, as as we had with materialism, right? Or at least that we have the same problems that the substance dualist sees with materialism. Um, so maybe one way to put this is, imagine on the one hand, a world of particles as fundamental constituents, and imagine on the other hand, a world of fields as fundamental constituents. Now, arguably these are two very different kinds of substances, right? But either way, it's hard to see how consciousness can arise in either world. Like whether or not the world is, so if the world in the world of fundamental particles or the world of fields, right, whatever the world is made of, it's hard to see how mentality, consciousness, phenomenal properties arise. Um, the problem is how you get from the non-mental, how you get from non-phenomenal to the phenomenal. Um, and I, I don't see how, sub, how if you were to suppose that the mental substance has non-mental properties, right, that just doesn't help. Um, on the other hand, if you deny that the mental substance has these non-mental properties, then it, that doesn't, that's not an explanation either, right, that's just totally empty. Um, it doesn't explain anything. In fact, not only does it not explain anything, but it's not clear that you've even offered an alternative to materialism because materialists are happy to accept that there are mental properties. So <laughs> if the substance dualist is just saying, well, there's this mental substance, but like it doesn't have any further non-mental properties. What's the difference between saying that and saying just generally there are mental properties, which a whole bunch of materialists endorse as well. Um, so. Yeah, substance dualism doesn't really explain what it's supposed to explain. It doesn't help. Um, e even if we assume that problems like the explanatory gap are legitimate problems that need an explanation, um, substance dualism doesn't help, uh, it seems to me. So I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's not a particularly good argument against it, but that's the answer you're getting. Um, Philippe Coelhol, Coelho, some, some Philippe, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name, sorry. Uh, he asks, how long is the schlong? Well, it's just over 6.5 inches. Um, and it's also got a, I don't know, I have me never measured the girth, but it has a pretty good girth as well. So it's, it's, it's good. It's not like big, but it's, I would say, on the larger side of average, which is exactly uh, the place I, I would want to be on this one. I think that's basically ideal. I'm very pleased with the size and shape of my dick. I think it's it's large enough to get a positive response, let's say, but um, it's not so large that it's going to be uh, scary or intimidating or painful. Like, I mean, if you, if you have a massive cock, um, that creates a whole lot of problems. I mean, I mean, for one, because a lot of women are just going to find that uncomfortable. I, I would not want a massive dick. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with what I've got. Uh, ha 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 ha, lol010101 asks, I'm curious about your plans for the future and whether you're still a grad student or what. Any tips or I wish I had known XYZ for your program? Well, I'm still doing my PhD. This is the last year. I don't know about the future. It would be good to go into academia, but very competitive. It might not happen. Who knows what's going to occur there. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to finish the PhD and, and we'll just see where it goes. Um, I don't really want to give any tips. I don't think that's really appropriate. So if you need any, if somebody needs advice about doing a PhD, I think you should ask 
lecturers, um, people who are more familiar with the field than I am. I mean, like, okay, I, I, I know philosophy, but I'm early in my career as a researcher. I, I, I don't know, I can't give people tips about this stuff. Hedonic Minimalist asks, what are your thoughts on voluntary eugenics? For example, do you think it would be good or bad for private individuals and or the government to pay drug addicts to get sterilized? In addition, would it be good or bad to give reduced prison sentences to criminals that are willing to get sterilized? Well, I don't really care what private individuals do. Um, sounds like a waste of money to me, but uh, if you wanna pay people to get sterilized, then you go ahead. Actually, I'd love it if somebody paid me to get sterilized. Um, I mean, that, that would be really cool because number one, I don't want kids. And number two, I then get, I get money for not having kids. So like, if you want to pay people to get sterilized, then can you, can you pay me first? I, like, I'm, I'm volunteering myself to receive the money that you want me to give. And, oh no, but you have to be a drug addict. Well, um, I can, I can start taking drugs for a bit. Um, if it means that I'll get money to be sterilized. So, <laughs> but, uh, okay. Um, also, drug addicts, like, I don't have a problem with drug addicts. You want to pay drug addicts to get sterilized? Like, drug addicts are the are the problem that you see with the world? I mean, seriously? That's... <laughs> who gives a shit if people take drugs? I, I do not care about that. Um, but anyway, uh, eugenics in general, I don't have a strong opinion on this. Um, the basic idea of improving the genetic condition of the population is is fine i mean it's a good idea uh indeed people already do uh, exercise choices over the genetics of their children um uh, I, I mean partly just from choosing a partner right you're exercising a choice over the child's genetics but also things like people can choose to abort a child if it has down syndrome and a lot of people do make that choice um and you know I, like there are some pretty plausible like there are good arguments for doing this right um I, uh, uh, why not do it in a more careful and directed way um I, I i so i don't in principle have a problem with this the problem with the scenario you're describing uh sterilization of drug addicts and criminals is that seems clearly to be a policy designed to target undesirables this is a socially conservative policy uh to get rid of the undesirables. And well, it's okay. I don't think this is even, if this was proposed like seriously by a politician, you know what, I, I, I would think this is more about uh, punishing undesirables than actually dealing with, with problems. I'm extremely skeptical that this would do anything to address rates of drug addiction or crime. Um, I mean, it's not as if there are literally like genes for crime. Obviously genetics has an influence because all of a person's traits are a product of the interaction between genes and environment, but the interactions there are just much, much more complex. Like sterilizing criminals, I don't think that would really meaningfully address crime rates. Um, certainly there are so many other policies that you, could, uh, that you could use that would have a better impact than that. I'd also bear in mind that if there is any racism in the justice system, um, and it, you know, there are, I think, you know, there's at least some plausible evidence that, that there is, um, at least in places like the US, uh, um, black people receiving higher sentences for the same crime, that kind of thing. Um, if there is racism in the justice system, and if there are certain minority groups that tend to be poorer, so tend to be in more need of money, then voluntary sterilization of criminals would end up being, in practice, race-based. It, it would still be race-based. It would end up primarily, uh, sterilizing minority groups which which should be a bit disturbing right so i i don't think that the particular kind of eugenics that you're talking about is one that we should support um humane hancock asks how do you justify how do you morally justify not living a vegan lifestyle um i guess i already talked a little bit about this um, so I, I don't care about animals. I, I don't feel like I have any moral obligations to them. And I've already talked about that earlier in the video um, in response to, what was the question? Uh, in response to uh, Adam Kennedy. Um, so uh, yeah, but 
he was talking specifically about animals, whereas you're just talking about the vegan lifestyle in general. The best argument for, well, I say the best argument. Um, yeah, well, I don't know. Look, if I don't care about animals, then the, 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 the other argument is going to be the environmental one. Um, and that's a very good argument, I think, for reducing meat consumption. Uh, like the, the environmental consequences are horrifying. Um, the problem is that that environmental argument only gets you so far because there are all kinds of things you can do to reduce your environmental impact. Uh, eating meat, is, so refraining from eating meat is one of the things you can do. And it's actually a relatively easy thing that you can do. But if somebody really loves meat, they might prefer to make other changes. Uh, also, you can just reduce your meat consumption. Like you might go from eating meat every day of the week to eating meat only once a week. Um, that will also reduce your environmental impact. Um, now you could reduce it further, right? You could reduce it further by refraining from eating meat ever, but you can always reduce your environmental impact further. I mean, if we're morally obligated to reduce our environmental impact to zero, then we have to all kill ourselves, uh, which, which would be absurd, right? Um, so there are lots of different things you can do to reduce your environmental impact. I think that reducing meat consumption is a it is a really easy option, um, a very straightforward one. And so it's worth promoting. Um, but I don't think we actually have an argument for veganism here. Uh, also, like, I don't have kids and I never want to have kids. And by not reproducing, I'm doing way more for the environment than a vegan who has reproduced. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, Having said all this, like I, I, I think it probably would be better to just get rid of the meat industry. And part of me does want the, the vegans to win, um, or at least I want them to win some of the, the battles. I mean, I don't know. I do like dairy and I do like the fact that we can do medical testing on animals, um, which if you're a vegan for moral concern for the animals, you may well object to that as well. Um, but, but yeah, I, it would be nice to produce less meat, let's say. Um, which is why I don't really talk about this kind of topic on my channel, because I kind of don't agree with the vegans' arguments, but I also want them to be more successful. So, um, you know, I'll just, I'll just not say anything. Um, uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, oh, I didn't uh, really answer your, your question, did I? Oh, no, I, I did. Um, because I, I do occasionally eat meat, but I don't eat a lot of meat. Um, JJ says, how is life without the neck beard? It'd be better with the neck beard. Uh, I mean, if you hold everything else fixed, it would have been better if I hadn't shaved the neck beard, but I have shaved it now and I, it'll come back one day. Joe Smith asks, why are the videos you do with Cole so blurry? They're not blurry. In some of the videos, I display text from the articles and you can see that it's not blurry. Um, you can easily read what you need to read. So if there's a problem, it'd be a problem with our webcams. Um, and I, I don't know how to fix that. I mean, I just have the webcam that's on my computer. I don't know what's going on where Cole is. Uh, so yeah. Uh, John Fisher Choir says, um, are you a PhD student? Uh, if so, do you have any advice? Starting a philosophy PhD next month. What are your plans, future career rise? Do you intend on pursuing a career in academia? Uh, I am a PhD student. Um, I, it would be nice to have a career in academia, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Very competitive and, you know, COVID and Brexit and all that is, it's going to do a number on the job market, no doubt. Um, as for advice, I'd say you should get advice from people who know the field better than I do. Uh, like talk to your advisors and talk to other philosophy lecturers. I'm not as knowledgeable about the field as I would need to be in order to give good advice about this because I'm still fairly early in my career and you know, th there's better places to get advice from. Kevin G says, uh, do you retain all of the information you teach in these videos? No, I retain very, very little. Most of the information is gone within a week. I often go back and have to watch my own videos about topics that I revisit later on. Um, 
<laughs> I mean, I've, I've mentioned this earlier, but this is the, the kind of, this is the lie of the, the higher pleasures, right? It turns out that higher pleasures are extremely difficult to attain. They require hours of difficult work, and yet they, just like the lower pleasures, they are also fleeting and provide no long-term satisfaction, and you end up with, with sort of nothing. The information just disappears um, horrifyingly quickly. Uh, so I, I retain very little of what I teach in these videos. How do you think knowing this much philosophy has impacted your long-term decision-making? I have no idea. I'm not a very uh, self-reflective person. I don't think, like, I, I make decisions and I engage in decision-making, but I don't think about, oh, how has this thing that I've done impacted my decision-making? I, I never really reflect on things in that way. Um, so I don't know, and maybe it hasn't really had any impact. I mean, it might have made me more critical in general, but I don't think philosophy has much influence on the rest of my life. I, I, I do philosophy and I do other stuff, um, but I, I compartmentalize it quite strongly. Um, I don't see myself as like living philosophy all the time. Uh, although maybe, I don't know, maybe I do because you know, the tools of conceptual analysis, the tools of you know, like logical arguments, constructing logical arguments, the tools that I, I apply those all the time. Um, even when I'm not doing philosophy, even if I'm just thinking about like, you know, what should I, you know, should I go to the cinema tomorrow? Um, the answer to that is almost always no, I'm not generally interested in the cinema, but you know, that kind of decision I will, um, I think possibly apply philosophical tools to that. So maybe it has impacted my life, but I don't really know. How can a learner get the most out of your body of videos? What approach have you used to become an expert in philosophy supplementary to your PhD program? Well, in the case of learning, it depends on what you want to achieve. Um, I'm, I'm really not sure. So there is, a, I, I suppose, the importance of active involvement. I mean, if you really want to become well-versed in these topics, you've got to do your own reading around the topic. So I guess you have to approach the videos as serving as a sort of map of the territory. But you'll need to explore the territory for yourself um, if you want to. I mean, it depends on how much you care about this. Like, if you, if you really want to get deep into these issues, then... Uh, I think you have to approach these videos as providing a map. They provide, they show, they show you where the different arguments are and how things are related overall. Um, but yeah, you just have to do your own reading. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not good at this sort of advice. How to become an expert? I mean, I, I don't even. Am I an expert? I'm not sure. I would consider myself an expert about this, but uh, read, write, talk. Um, Man, th there are a lot of people who are much more knowledgeable about all all thing all, all areas of philosophy than than I am. Um, uh, Katir, uh, I think, is is the pronunciation there. asks What do you know about Islamic philosophy? Sir Pancreas also asked about this. I know nothing about it. It's not taught. Uh, even in my own readings, I haven't come across it. Um, this is unlike some other uh, areas of philosophy. I mean, I've come across like Indian philosophy. I've, I've come across certainly Buddhist philosophy. Um, I mean, Graham Priest, uh, Jay Garfield, uh, they've done, uh, they've engaged a bit with Buddhist philosophy. So I've, I've, I've come across Buddhist philosophy. There are connections to um, the analytic tradition. Um, but Islamic philosophy, just, no, I, I really don't know anything uh, about that. Leonardo Macedo says, um, in August Comte, pe the people say the philosophy is dead. Why is this? Positivism is the revolution, techno technological and the science being true. I'm not sure what you're asking here, but I don't, I don't know Comte's philosophy. I'm probably not even pronouncing his name correctly, but I can't say anything about this. Um, Magnesium Mike 
says, lots of philosophers describe the analytic continental divide as a difference in style or a difference in academic social norms. Others say that one side is doing real philosophy and the other is not. Setting aside these views, do you think there are any clear substantive disagreements between the two sides on some philosophical thesis? Well, you've framed this question in an interesting way, because what I want to say is there's no such thing as analytic philosophy. Um, I say this if I'm in a contrarian mood, um, but but like, there's a serious point to it. Uh, there used to be such a thing as analytic philosophy. Uh, there was a period where philosophers in you know, the English-speaking world were engaging in linguistic analysis with a goal of probing beneath the surface grammar of our speech in order to reveal the logical form of uh, of, of sentences, propositions. Um, so these philosophers were concerned with essentially constructing an ideal language. Um, they you know, wanted to take ordinary language, which is messy, vague, incoherent, probe into its logical form and translate it into this ideal language. And so, you know, Russell's on denoting is the classic example of this, right? That makes sense to call analytic philosophy right but then there's all, all this stuff happens all this other stuff happens over the 20th century ordinary language philosophy comes along um, and then you get the collapse of logical positivism with quine's attack you get the resurgence of metaphysics you get uh the resurgence of ethics and political philosophy in philosophy of science you get this more like historicist orientation with people like thomas kuhn and firebend and and so on and i mean i don't think there's a co like a cohesive tradition anymore. I don't think it makes sense to see this as being like a single thing, analytic philosophy. Um, it's it's very misleading. I, I I think the phrase analytic philosophy is um, it, it's it's mean it's not meaningful or helpful. Um, I'd say therefore that the the difference between the analytics and continentals maybe it is just a difference in in style or uh, perhaps a difference in kinds of questions they ask, um, the kinds of things they're interested in. Um, but but yeah, I mean, look, there, 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 there is no such thing as analytic philosophy. So asking me how analytic philosophy compares to continental philosophy, I can't tell you. But you know, you're asking me to set aside this sort of view. So what does that mean? In the counterfactual situation in which there is such a thing as analytic philosophy, right? Uh, would there be any substantive disagreement with continental philosophers? Well, that depends on how you want to describe the counterfactual situation, right? That's up to you. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, look, uh, if, if I try to give a serious answer to this, part of the problem here is I don't know continental philosophy. So you're asking me to compare something that doesn't really exist with something that I don't know and maybe also doesn't really exist. Um, but m maybe uh, my initial reaction, just off the top of my head, the main disagreement, the sort of substantive difference between the two sides, I feel like maybe in terms of methodology, genealogical methods, I think that continental philosophers, you know, Michel Foucault, people like that, they, they rely on these genealogical methods where you learn about a concept by studying the historical development of the concept and the role that the concept has played in social institutions. Whereas analytic philosophers engage more in this like ahistorical, that they, they, they engage in ahistorical analysis and they're not really so concerned about how the concept is used. Although even that isn't, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> um, Majesty of Reason asks, what are some of the best philosophical tools for thinking critically about philosophy of science? Well, surely it would be the same tools we apply elsewhere. Surely it would be conceptual analysis, inference to the best explanation, reflective equilibrium, thought experiments. Uh, wouldn't it? I mean, why, why would that be different? I mean, I suppose, that for, like, yeah, okay, so for me, I have preferences about the sort of tools we apply. Like, I don't really go in for inference to the best explanation. Um, but that's just a consequence of my broader epistemological uh, stand standpoint, right? Like I'm a fairly hardcore empiricist, so um, I tend to be resistant to inference the best explanation and things like that. But 
tools for thinking critically about philosophy of science. Um, I, I would have thought it's the same philosophical tools you use in other contexts. Um, Maleng Default asks thoughts on New Wave or Neo Aristotelians slash Thomists. Do you find anything valuable in their metaphysical schema? I don't know them. Well, the only context in which I'm familiar with Neo Aristotelians is virtue ethics, um, where I think they tend to defend some fairly controversial biological claims, like they, they try to uh, defend the idea that, that there's like teleology in biology which I reject um, yeah I, I, I don't know anything about this Mandible asks can you act can you at all act or tell others to act and be moral if you don't have a perfect moral principle I don't know what a perfect moral principle would be but I mean yeah you can totally tell others to act moral I mean what counts as yeah. Look, I'm an anti-realist about about morality, so like it's up to you, right? Uh, you you construct uh, your moral attitudes, your moral system, and m the vast majority of people are going to have contradictions and just general incoherencies in their moral beliefs, no doubt, because a lot of people don't think about it um, in that much detail. But that certainly doesn't stop you from expressing moral views. And why would it? I mean, uh, uh, I don't think you need, like, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with expressing views about something, even though you have some beliefs that are contradictory or false or whatever. Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by perfect moral principle, but I'm just assuming that that's going to be something like a what, like, true and coherent moral system or something like that. Um, certainly nobody can have a true moral system because there are no moral facts, in my view. Uh, there are no moral truths. Um, you can have a coherent moral system, um, but I don't think you need to in order to express moral views. Uh, Menes asks, could you please do a video on why logical positivism failed? Well, I do have a video on verificationism where I talk uh, about the objections to verificationism in some detail. Obviously, verificationism is the uh, central idea of logical positivism. Uh, I've also touched on some of the reasons in my Philosophy of Science series. I would say that, I don't know, I don't have any immediate plans to do a video on logical positivism, but I would say the logical positivists, I think, maybe more than any other group of philosophers in the, in the philosophy of science are seriously caricatured. And it, it would be useful, I think, to do a video exploring um, all of the different ideas that the logical positivists had and showing some of the variety of their views and some of the sophistication of their views. Because um, a lot of the history of logical positivism now, it's, it's like cardboard history, you know, it's... Uh, it's highly caricatured. Um, so one day I may well uh, do a video on this, but I don't have any immediate plans to do so. Matthew McClure says, any advice for a philosophy undergrad, undergrad that wants to get into a top graduate program? No, I suggest you speak to your lecturers about this. They will be able to advise you much better than I will. Um, so I don't really want to say anything about that. 